they don't even do that all at once. They sleep in short little naps of a couple minutes at a time. They sleep standing up and often with their eyes open. So that allows you to What is a group of giraffes called? A group of giraffes is called a tower. That's actually one of my favorite animal facts is just different groups of animals. If you want to look up different groups of animals and what they're called, a group of giraffes is called a tower. A group of tortoises is called a creek. Do you have any of those? Groups? Yeah. A murder of crows. A murder of crows. But if it's ravens, then it's a conspiracy of ravens. Oh, I didn't know that one. That's a good one. Yes. And your mom's tuning in. She says hi. Hi, mom. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I forgot the instruction. I got distracted. I got to say hi to my mom. <laughs> All right, so once you have it folded, and it, you can probably see that on many papers and mirrors that are folding, um, you can see the big X in the middle. So you're going to take your corner and fold the corner up into the middle of that X. Make a nice little triangle on that side. You're so helpful. the largest pollinator is. The largest pollinator? No, what's the largest pollinator? It's actually giraffe. It's actually giraffe? Yeah, it's not a lot, but when they eat on the trees and then they go to other trees, they've got some of the pollen on their oh. lips and they'll actually take it to the other trees. I love it. That's <laughs> so cool. Pollinators are really important. That's why we want to spread awareness about bees a lot because pollinators help us keep all of our plants, which are essential to all life on Earth. You have all of your corners as we're building our little fortune teller here. You can make sure all of your corners. Ooh, I that one a little bit far. You make sure all your corners come into the center, so you want to line them up as close as you can to the center. Mine is not working out great. I hope yours is doing better. Not my mind folded. It's okay. It's okay. All right. So once you have all of your corners there in the middle, you're going to go ahead and do the same thing again. So you're right. No, fold it over. Sorry. So turn it all the way over, so all of your little triangles are on the bottom now. Then you're going to do the same thing again. So you're going to fold this into the center. And you're going to keep going around doing that. Another fun fact, let's see, my um, polar bears have black skin. And this is so that they actually don't have a white fur necessarily. Their fur is more of a clear hollow. It just shows up as white because it all fits together. <laughs> um, since they have so much of it, it looks white. But the reason they have black skin and clear, ooh, oh my goodness, kind of wonky, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is so that the sun will get through the clear enough to help them warm up with that dark colored skin since they are in the Arctic. And I know I did wrong again. And uh and their and then their clear skin of kind of or their clear fur also protects them from the sun so they're not getting a sunburn, but they are getting the heat from it. I'm trying to fix mine a little bit. Well, you do. Interesting, but a lot of people may not realize. Polar bears and penguins. Oh. Bird chat. Bird chat. Bird chat will be in five minutes. Ask a keeper near you for location. actually don't live in the same hemispheres. A lot of people think that penguins and polar bears are kind of in the same areas, but they're not. Polar bears are only in the northern hemisphere, while those penguins are in the southern hemisphere. So when you watch The Little Mermaid 2, that is false. 
<laughs> oh yeah. no, I think it was walruses, I apologize. Hey. <laughs> but also walruses are up in the north as well, so you won't see them with penguins either. Yeah, that's true, that's absolutely true. We, uh, in fact, when I was a kid, I think the game was called Don't Break the Ice, but there was like a board game, and you were a little penguin, and you had to make it across all the ice, and the polar bear trying to come and get you. And so all of that media stuff, games and movies and things like that, they just think that they're in the same region, and they're not. So I was pretty surprised to learn that too after I was older. Question back. And there's also some penguins that live in Africa. That's true, there are some African penguins. So penguins, yeah, kind of a little bit diverse. Yeah. All right, so um, once you have your, your triangles on one side, and on the other side you have squares, you're going to turn it over so the squares on the outside and fold it in half. So your triangles on the inside, fold it. This time, instead of folding it diagonally, you're going to fold it in half like, as I used to say when we were in school, like a hot dog. So we fold it in half that way. And then slip your fingers in here. Underneath all of the flaps. And you're going to kind of poof out the outside and then push it all together like that. And now you have a fun fortune teller. So what we're going to do on the outside, so now that you have it and you see how it works, you can come and decorate it on the outside. So on your outside, you're going to want to add four different animals. Now you can put whatever animals you want. I put, so we'll let Megan choose her animals and draw some pictures. Now, keep in mind, because when you fold it, how we're going to play is you count the letters in each animal. So, um, I'll do one with Denise while I'm making it is that ready? You want to pick an animal? Your bear. Bear. So, bear has four letters in it, so we're going to open it four times. B, E, A, R. So then, we're up to numbers. What number do you want? Five. Five. Oh, sorry, then you count five. Sorry. One, two, three. Four, five, pick another number. Two, three. Great, and then the second time you pick a number, you open it up, and now I can tell the news for a fun fact. Polar bears have black skin, to very comfy about. So, that way you can go up to your friends and family and have them pick, and you can tell them a fun new animal fact. So, that being said, when you pick your four animals, you maybe don't want to pick something like a hippopotamus, because that's going to have a lot of letters. So unless you want to do this a lot of times, you're going to want to add to pick short animals. So I pick dog, cat, bird, and bear. So you know, Megan pick her animals. I wrote the letters on there so that way I don't forget what how many letters I need. So to do that, you want to make sure your flat is a lot easier to draw. And while Megan is decorating hers, we'll share some more animal facts. Let's see. Uh, I know right before we started, uh, we were talking about hyenas and how hyenas are actually female dominant. So um, the females are the matriarchs, so we call that a matriarchy when the females are in charge. Just like when the males are in charge, we call it a patriarchy. So the females are actually the ones that are in charge in hyenas. And they work and things like that. My phone is really active today. Sorry guys. I don't know if you guys can hear it though. It interrupts us. But Do you have any more animal facts while you're uh, decorating? Three facts. Okay, I have all the animal facts. Not really, but I have a lot. <laughs> it's funny because we know a lot of animal facts, but when you're like trying to think of them, sometimes you you rank crazy. So. so there are different types of killer whales. There are transient killer whales and resident killer whales. Generally, resident killer whales, they eat like fish and things like that, whereas transient killer whales usually eat other marine mammals. And their vocalizations will be a little bit different because marine mammals' frequency of hearing is a little bit different than a fish's frequency of hearing. Interesting. Okay, see, that's why I didn't know. Denise has a lot of uh, marine and animal facts that I don't have. So uh, she always shares those with us, so that's really fun. That's really something that's actually fun about the uh, Lost Keeper series. We have different backgrounds, so we can share different fun facts and information with each other that other ones mostly don't have. Um, 
speaking of, yeah, different frequencies and stuff, that's another fun animal fact, is that bats actually use echolocation to find their prey. So when the bats are out there actually bouncing waves, sound waves off of things to find the bugs and things that they're looking to eat. Yes? Are there other animals that use echolocation besides there, bats? There are other animals that use echolocation, although I can't think of any. I'm sure you have something in mind. Dolphins. Dolphins. That's, that's what they're there's something else though. I'm sure there is. I'm sure. Ooh. If you know it, Fancy. you look it up. Let us know. Sorry. Draco has all of these pin feathers, so that's a fun carrot fact. We'll see if we can find any. I've gotten quite a few, so there's not very many left. But when birds have feathers that grow in, that one's not ready, but you can see it. Their feathers grow in like this little casing, and it makes their feathers look like almost like a porcupine quill. So what they do to each other, so that one's not ready either, but you can see it, it's starting to grow in there, and then um, the outside part comes off. So when it's ready, it dries, it kind of gets drier, and it flakes off, and it's almost comes off looking like dandruff, but that's how the feather pokes out. So you can see the outside part is flaking off, and then usually they'll groom themselves, but you can't reach the back of his head, so in the wild, a lot of birds will actually go choose a mate that will do that for them. Um, but we do it for some of our birds here that don't have partners because then they have human partners. So we go when I first picked him up today, he had a whole bunch. Um, but I tend to like get those off of him. Feels good, huh? Yeah, yeah. Alright, do your pictures. What animals do we have? Let's see. Uh, I have a lion, a dog, a turtle, and a very poorly drawn beaver. <laughs> it's not as bad as my lizard. Uh, that's true. I couldn't tell what Denise's lizard was unless she told me. So that's okay. We all have different levels of art skills, so it's fine. All right, so then once you have your animals, you're going to turn it over, and you're just going to number the inside. So I did mine in a rainbow. You can do yours in any colors you want. You can do it all in the same color. Whatever you want to do, you're just going to have numbers on there. And just start with one, and then just go around the circle. One, two, three, four. Perfect. So once you do that, now you're going to open it up and you can open up one flap at a time and write some facts in there. So you see mine, I opened it, I drew a line down the middle so we know which side is for the one and which side is for the two. And then you're going to write facts. Now don't tell me what your facts are, write some animal facts. And that way when we play in a minute, I can learn some new facts. So. You're just going to write your back on one side, write a line down the middle, and write another back, and you're going to keep doing that all the way around until you have eight facts. So, <laughs> see, that's that brain freeze thing. Megan's looking at me like, ah, I don't know your animal facts. She knows a lot of your animal facts. She just can't think of them at the moment. <laughs> the pressure. Uh, I will tell you another fun animal fact, uh, bird-wise is that flamingos are actually not naturally pink. They're born a gray color, so their feathers are coming gray. And because of their diet, they actually turn to that pink color. So that's not their natural color, although that is their natural diet. So it is supposed to happen that way. It's not like people are going out and dying with flamingos. But uh, they are born gray. That is a fun flamingo fact. I don't have any flamingos here. Uh, but a fun guinea fowl fact, we are right across from the guinea fowl. The guinea fowl um, are actually, you can't tell them apart. Even though we have here, we have a male and a female, you can't tell them apart based on their coloring. So our male is actually really, I think like black with a lot of white spots. Which one? Uh, and our female is more of a gray color, really lighter than the male. However, you can have males in that color and females in the other color. They're kind of interchangeable. The way you can tell them apart is by the sound they make and by their waddle. So just like the turkey has that red waddle underneath his chin. Same thing with the guinea fowl, and the males have more of that red skin underneath. Oh, Ringo's talking. Ringo does talk. So parrots do a lot of mimicking. Um, they like to say words. Ringo's favorite is high, but he doesn't say it very much when we're holding him because he likes to do it to get our attention. So when he already has our attention, so I tried to get him to say hi earlier and he didn't do it. You should say hi to everybody. No? I have another fun fact. Yes, more 
fun facts. That's what we're doing. Invasive species. Did you know there is a population of hippopotamuses in South America? Oh. How did they get there? I do. Um, Pablo Escobar, he had a zoo down in South America, and then they released the hippos, and they've actually created, I think there's a population of like 40 to 60, and they actually do really well down there because they actually don't go through a dry season, so they're able to mature and do a little bit better than they would in Africa, so their population has kind of bloomed per se. So there's an invasive species of hippopotamus down in South America. That is, that is a very interesting fact. So yeah, uh, invasive species are pretty interesting in and of themselves. So uh, a lot of times so invasive species are things that we talk about that aren't supposed to be there. So hippopotamuses are not native to South America. And so they go in and they take over because they can thrive there, but they're not native to there. So they'll actually take over resources from other animals that are native to them. Lionfish are another invasive species down in Florida. They're not native to Florida area. Uh, Florida, I think, has a lot of invasive species. Florida's a really easy place for animals to live if they have a lot of good environment, a lot of animals like it's got high humidity, it's kind of wet, and there's plenty of plants and things, and so there's a, quite a few invasive species. Well, one of the reasons that people uh, have invasive species in their areas is actually because people will get pets, uh, kind of like these guys, uh, they will get them because they think they're really fun and awesome, and then they'll kind of decide to release them in the wild. This is not a very good idea. Uh, they will, one, cause invasive species. I know there's, in Florida, actually speaking of Florida, there is an invasive, I can't remember what parrot it is, but somebody let their pet parrot talk. Oh, I don't remember which one it is either. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I want to say lorikeets, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, but they let their parrots out because they didn't want them anymore, and surprisingly, they thrive. So you'll either have one of two things happen. You'll end up with an invasive species, like the parrots, they bred and created more, and now there are big flocks of parrots that are taking over the natural homes of other birds that are native to the area, or your pet is going to die off, which is the most likely thing, because these guys don't know how to take care of themselves. We talk about that a lot with our lions, too. These guys, uh, they don't, you know, have the skills it takes to live in the wild. The wild is a hard place, and these guys are pretty spoiled. Um, they're used to having air conditioning and their food brought to them, and so if they did go out, they would know how to hunt and some of our lions are also really picky about the temperature of their food. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, yeah, some of our, that's a fun fact about our lions in specific, is some of our cats, uh, if you give them their food, they like it to be almost frozen. I know Rock and Buzzy are ones that really like cold meat, so if you give, if you give them anything that's not almost frozen, they don't want it. But some of our other cats, if it's that cold, they won't eat it. They want it to be that nice, so they are very picky. So I don't think they'd be too their food down. How's it going, Megan? Are we almost done on the back? We're halfway there. We're halfway there. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll be excited. That's true, because I'm also taking up some of her ideas as we keep going. That is a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorites is, let's see, ostriches actually have, and we've actually had debates about this here with our keepers, because we are like, there's no way this can be true, but we've looked it up several times. Um, ostriches have the largest eyeball out of any land animal. So there are males and eyeballs. <laughs> That's my fiance, there's no way to tell by the phone. Hi, I'm <laughs> um, So, uh, yeah, they have the largest eyeball. So we kind of argue because we have a giraffe, and we see both the ostriches and the giraffe pretty up close, and some of the keepers here were like, there's no way, because Ozzy has such a big eyeball, there's no way that the ostriches have a bigger eyeball. And it's really close, but they do have the biggest eyeball. Yes. Giraffe eyeballs are about the size of a golf ball. There you go. <laughs> that's a good one, see? And that's a nice, easy one that you can say really fast. So, um, yeah, they... Uh, yeah, they're actually about the size of a golf ball, and ostriches are just a tiny bit bigger, so it's really close to the size of a golf ball, but they are a tiny bit bigger. Uh, speaking of things that are the size of other things, I uh, can't remember now the kind of bat, but the smallest uh, mammal is actually a species of bat. If I think of the species, I will say. 
but it's a species of bat and they're the size of two M&Ms. They're very tiny. You almost there, Megan? Two more. Two more. <laughs> Beavers are also a female dominant. <laughs> lemurs, lemurs are also female dominant. Have yeah. you ever heard of what a fission fusion society is? A fusion fusion society. No. So we've heard of matriarchal, patriarchal. There are animals that will come together and break apart by choosing the animals they want to be with. Did you know that giraffe are actually a fission fusion society? Really? Mm -hmm. ah, I did not. Very cool. Oh, I do have one that's Megan's fact actually that she gave me earlier. Did you use it for your? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, Megan's favorite movie is Jurassic Park, and she told me that the T-Rex foot that they used in Jurassic Park, they modeled after an emu. So emu foot, feet are very interesting, and birds actually, they are discovered, are probably one of the closest relatives to a lot of dinosaurs. So, bird feet, oh, I lost that. Oh, there it is. Uh, bird feet, no, we're going to, no, we'll see, we're going to start yelling, and then, like, we're going to start talking louder, and then, um, yeah, emu feet are really interesting. Emus have three toes, but ostriches are actually two toes. So all the birds really have three or four toes. You can see Ringo has four toes. He's got two in the front and two in the back, which is called zygodactyl. Um, but ostriches only have two toes, and it is so that they can run really quickly. So another fun fact is that ostriches run up to about 40 miles per hour people will actually ride them. So they will actually have ostrich races because they run so fast that people, and they're so strong, they have really strong legs, smaller people are able to sit on top of the ostrich and actually do ostrich races. We do not recommend this. <laughs> no, I definitely don't try that at all kind of thing. There, there are people that do that, but I'm not, I'm not one of them, and I don't recommend you try it either. <laughs> do you know what the ampullae of Lorenzini is. I don't even know what you said to you guys. <laughs> the ampullae of Lorenzini. No. It's that little electric sense that the sharks have. It's a little sensor. Oh, That's how they sense those kind of electric yeah. things in the water. Okay, yeah, perfect. That's a good one. I don't think I'll remember that really nice long scientific word, maybe after a while. But uh, yeah, it's the and they do have like an electromagnetic pulse thing and they'll come navigate. And that's what it's called. There you go. All right, she's ready. I got so I got hopefully you guys also have one at home too. So all right, so go ahead and put your uh, portion all together. All right, can you see your animals again? Help us out, that's what makes us able to stay here and take care of all the animals here. 
we have here at the ranch. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for all your donations.